uh, no, it was daytime, it was like 11.15 or so, so, you know, I only know like probably two or three people were able to make it or so. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, where are, my, where are my manners? If you went to the Tuesday talk, if you can put like Tuesday and then sign your name and then Thursday. I want to make sure that everyone can win. Uh, if you have an unexcused absence that you get, uh, you get credit for that. Like that's like a makeup since you took an hour out of your time for our event. As with all my events, like the one this morning that was here, uh, Storyteller. Which turned out to be great, and it's a LaGrange College grad. And one thing she did that I, I always tell people to do, and they don't, speakers don't always do this, is try to explain, like, when you graduated from college, in this case, she graduated from here, what do you do? Because that's a big, big question mark. And I think I tell every single speaker, do this, and most of them go, yeah, 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 they talk about whatever they want to in politics. And we, our department got a lot of good scores on, on tests, uh, not everything was perfect. There's like one or two who, uh, who bombed something that made us look bad. We're not as good as we should be. We're within the average. I think our scores could go much higher on a thing or two. But in terms of evaluations from students, we're off the charts. Nothing to complain about. The only thing where we struggle a little bit it has to do with career planning. And it's something, you know, those who have responded have said, you know, those who are pretty active are like, yeah, they do a lot of this. People who are only tangentially active, Gave us low scores because they're not staying in with us. But I will still do my best, and I'll leave it around. Uh, I will still do my best to uh, get you, make sure the speakers talk about it. Uh, I'm tapping work studies on getting you career opportunities. There is a job fair on the 17th of September. Uh, I'm, I'm now in touch with the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So any job opportunities locally that people are looking for. And I forwarded it to two recent LC grads, one who's a parent who's waiting a year before going off to grad school, where she'll dominate there, uh, but it doesn't have anything yet. So I, I texted her the information about it. And another's a guy studying for the LSAT, but he's kind of come up in October. He's looking for something to hold him over for a year before he goes to law school. So we look out for you in career stuff. Just keep that in mind. Those were only low scores, and I'm like, you know what? Yeah. We could always do better. What? I don't look at it and go, oh, hide that. You know, you can either hide it or you can uh, adopt it. So that's what we're looking to do. What day did you say it was, sir? It'll be 17th, and I think it starts around 10 o'clock, goes to 2. It's called Drive In. I don't have the information. Wait, no, I do have the information. I posted it at the LaGrange College Political Science Facebook page. So, if you're a member of that Facebook page, I think you can access it. If you're not, I still think you might be able to, but if you can't, let me know. If you want to be part of that, you do not have to be a major. You do not have to be a minor. Well, you use a Pulse and a Facebook account. But if you want to do that, and I give updates about what speakers we're bringing to campus, uh, political speakers coming on in, like when Mike Pence spoke up in Atlanta, I got an invite for that. He's the Trump vice president candidate. I posted it up there. So those of you who are members, you probably see this. I try and post one thing a day again, or I'll focus something about political science careers, something about the majors. Political science discipline looks much better for the future. I'm so excited. I knew our numbers were pretty good in 2012. They're even better. So, uh, and it turns out that I always compare us with the hardest group the hard sciences. It turns out that the professional pro programs, like the business majors and stuff, uh, short term they've got us, but you get your grad degree and long term over earnings, yeah, political science beats it. So those, those uh, business people got to step up their game. So. so that's good to see. I like us, I don't want us to compete with easy, not like University of Florida Gators, how they schedule three cream crops. You know, I wouldn't be like Florida State, schedule an Ole Miss or uh, Oklahoma playing Houston, you know, or Oklahoma playing Ohio State. Good Lord, what was Oklahoma doing? <laughs> but that's what I want. I'm preaching to the choir, but attendance matters in real life. So I'm going to be uh, right about 11, so I'm going to do up attendance. But if you know someone in this class, I know there are a couple football players. If you know someone is, even if you've got a sporting activity, you've got to let me know. Seriously, that's, that's how it goes in real life. So, I mean, the athletic department does not send, I mean, they'll say, yeah, we've got a game. Sometimes they send us out something about a game. There might be like a long <laughs> list. Nah, it's on you to personally do it. So, 
make sure you do that, and I'll make sure that everybody who isn't here is getting an angry email from me saying, hey, I can't just not be here. Seriously, true story. Friend, uh, friend of mine, computer science major, didn't show up and stuff. You know, didn't show up two days at work, just random days. One of, you know, both of them he claimed to be sick. He was probably sick for at least one of them, maybe both or so. Our alarm was late. Second time he was fired. Really fine, but you're just not trustworthy. And that's how it goes. So make sure that uh, you, do, you do what you're already doing. And uh, if you know somebody in class that you care about, how well they do, make sure that they are here. OK, I knew a couple people couldn't be here. I see Tyreek is here. Brittany. Is there you? Brian is here. And if Harrison can't be, I see Grant is here. Wesley? Very good, Betsy. Uh, no parking can't be. Uh, no Jordan. Is Jordan on the, Jordan on the team? got two things to do. While I'm pulling that up, I need people to tell me. Oh, it's been taken. Yeah, yeah. thanks. All that other stuff. Thanks a lot. I need someone to tell me what elitism is. Go ahead. Tell me what elitism there is, since it's going to be on the exam. people have all the power Okay. Or at least a lot of the power. Maybe not all of it, but they got a disproportionate amount of the power. Very good. Now, how do we know who's an elite and who's not an elite? Are you elite? Are you going to be elite? They have a lot of power. How do we know who has power and who doesn't? Remember, this is all theory stuff. Right? Power is vague. Give me specifics. Usually they have a lot of money. Okay. Money. Money is power. Good. What else? Okay, they hold the position uh, of power. Constitutional, national constitution, state constitutional, local charter. That gives them, the laws give them a lot of power. Good, what else? How else do we know somebody's in a legal? Education. Education, how much they know, how much uh, the connections they made in school. That's why I put that political science page together for networking. Everyone can see who everyone is and what they're doing. Okay, sometimes family. You got a big family name, a brand name. Kennedy's, Clinton's, Bush's, you know, the name means something. Okay, what else? Leadership skills. Skills, several of them. Leadership skills. They're good organizers. Communication skills, which sometimes a professor lacks, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> and be able to speak to people, persuade people. Communication isn't just Communication isn't just speaking, it's also writing. So when you write up, I want to see a lot of good communication skills. Persuade people that your candidate on this issue is the winning one. That paper that's due a week from today, jot this down and remind me of this on Monday. Get it to the writing center. Write it up today. It does not take as long as you think to do. Enjoy your weekend. You should. I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff this afternoon. Why? So I can take my son to the Braves Nationals game on Saturday. And he has a party at noon and on Sunday, so my weekend's going to be shot otherwise. Yeah. Work hard today, this afternoon. Knock it out. 4 or 5 p.m. will seem all the sweeter. Because you don't have anything hanging over you. Get it done by early next week. Why? It's not due until the 23rd. That gives you enough time to take it to the writing center. I think the writing center is right over there. If you don't see somebody there for it, um, go to the English department. I think Justin Thurman's the head of that group. Get with somebody. They'll look at your paper. They'll make suggestions. This is all about boosting your grade. I have people who take my classes, especially like American Experience, because they don't know me as majors or 1,000 level, and they're like, how do we do extra credit at the end? You don't do it at the end. You do it during. This is extra credit. Give yourself extra credit. Don't ask me. JFK said, ask not what you can do for your country. Ask what you can do for you. <laughs> ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. What can you do to improve your extra credit grade? Right? Give yourself extra credit. How do you do that? Get it done early. Do the best possible job. 
like what you think is going to be an A, give it to them. If it's a B, they'll tell you how to get an A. If it's a C, they'll tell you how to get an A. Right? But do a good job. Knock it out. Make, make an effort. Eat lunch. Drink that Jolt Cola. Wait, they don't sell it. I think it's illegal. Drink that coffee. Drink. Get something from Starbucks. Get something behind you. You're going to knock it out. Enjoy your weekend. You deserve that weekend. Then Monday, when the tutors come back, turn it, you know, look it over maybe one more time. You know, after you enjoy the weekend, it'll probably look a little different. Hopefully not like this, but you'll have a good weekend. But take it on over to them. They'll need a day or so to chew on it. They'll get it back to you by Tuesday. You're handing it in on Wednesday. How about five extra points? Would that help you? So if you get a 95 on the paper, and you've taken it to the writing center, like they send me the report. Every time one of you goes to the writing center, they send me a report. You get a 95 on that paper, I'll give you 100. 90, I'll give you a 95. 75, I'll give you an 80 if you took it to the writing center. That's my rule. Worth it? Write it down. So knock it out today. Enjoy the weekend. Oh, it's all tempting. The sun probably sounds like Antonio Banderas. Enjoy your evening, folks. It's in the 90s out there. I don't mean like the greatest hits of the 90s. <laughs> Got it? Get that done. Write it down in your notes. You owe it to yourself. If you got a friend in this class who isn't here, please email it to him. Hey, alert. We can get extra points this way. I can't believe Dr. Torres is giving these points away. All right. What is circulation of elites? Why do we have circulation of elites? Wesley? To keep fresh. Yeah, why do you want to keep elites fresh? Yeah, you always need new ideas. Sometimes the small country club doesn't have all the answers. You know, Europe was like this for a long time. Europe just stayed the way Europe was going. You know what they call that era? The Dark Ages. Why do they call that? I don't know, maybe they had invented electricity or something. Yeah, whatever it was. You know, yeah, there was a lot of fighting, and, you know, small groups of cliques of people, monks up in monasteries, kings up in castles, very insular, not a lot of new ideas. Then folks started doing a little, a couple groups started traveling a little bit, folks from Venice, folks from Portugal. They went to other places, they went to like Africa, they went over to the Middle East, they went over to China, and they're like, holy shit, sorry. there is a lot of cool stuff out there that we, they figured this stuff out, we don't have this. They got new ideas. They went to new places, right? Then what did Europe go through? Begins with an R. The Renaissance. The Renaissance. What the hell is a Renaissance? Yeah. Rebirth. New ideas. Like the Chinese are like, wow, fireworks. Wow, cool. Ah, Fourth of July. You love that stuff. Somebody's like, mm, we do blow up stuff. That damn castle where the the king's been ruling us for a while. I bet you we could make short work of his stuff with this. Nifty things we found over in China. Boom! No more castles. Bust the nobility. Uh, we'll pour boiling oil on them. <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll take you out from 100 yards away. <laughs> oh, catapults. Mm, but this has a little more kick to it. It's like me throwing a football versus Aaron Rodgers throwing a football. <laughs> a lot more accurate. A lot more stopping power. Right? New ideas. Circulation of elites need those to, to be on top. If you're in my international political economy class, anybody here in my IP class? Yeah. Uh, you need to realize that elites, there's a survey they do, elites and masses, elites like immigration. Do you know why? More than the masses, any guesses? Don't give me the correct answer, Wesley. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But yeah, you're right. Some of it's for cheap labor. So why are they uh, bringing in all these uh, professionals, these highly tech people? Why are they bringing them in? It's not just, they're not just like importing a bunch of uh, the poorest of the poor. Why are they bringing in a lot of highly professional, skilled individuals? Yeah, new ideas. That's part of the circulation of elites. We brought in some guy who was a Vietnamese boat person who was trying to escape out of his communist country, made it over to Thailand. We brought him on over, 
got him, gave him a little scholarship over in Boston. Now you got Google search engines. He wrote some of the algorithms that uh, revolutionized how we find things on the internet. Cool new idea. Now Google's a titan. Is that helping the US as a power? It's helping keep us a tech and economic superpower. New ideas, folks. Yep, and they can come, they can come internationally or they can come domestically. Non-wasps. Somebody figured out, maybe it took them all the way till the 60s or so, but somebody figured out, hey, we're not the only smart people here. Why else do you want to do circulation of elites? New ideas, yes. Ronald, what's another reason for circulation of elites? Don't worry, folks in the back, I'll be getting to you. First, you want the smart folks in. Why else? The what? I think that's who needs some help. Somebody help me for how, what you're going to put for the exam. You are on fire. What's up? I want a new look. Okay, we got the new ideas, new look, but why else do you want circulation of elites? There was another reason, the, the positive reason. New ideas! What's the other reason? Sid? To keep things fair and unbiased towards like, the people who are in power? Yeah, you, those, those people out of power outnumber you. They're going to get kind of upset. Kings and castles. They didn't change. They didn't move with the time. They didn't have a circulation of elites. Eventually, the masses overthrew them. English Revolution, French Revolution, American Revolution. Yeah. Kings lost. No new ideas. They kept everything in blood. Not, oh, blood, but like, bam. <laughs> Brittany, what's a wasp? A wasp? It's, it's not like, it's a, it's a white. So what, guys? Like, yeah, right. like, what's the rest of what's the ASP? I'm, I'm trying to think of it. Not a steak from Egypt. Uh, the what? Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You had to be those right things. My grandfather, Tony Yakowenko. Who the hell would hire somebody with that name? Immigrant. Went to work for a security bank. He changed his name to Anthony C. Owen. Yakowenko, the O-W-E-N, can be taken from the middle. Made it all the way up to vice president. Didn't get to be president because everybody knew he wasn't really English. He was like Polish-Ukrainian. So you can make it over. I mean, he won the Nicholson Award for most outstanding banker in, uh, in Michigan. Was like good friends with a guy named Gerald Ford who went on to become president. I mean, Security Bank went from being this tiny little bank to the strongest in Michigan. Uh, got bought by uh, Bank of America which is now like NCMB or whatever. Banks started doing a lot of mergers. Yeah, he won, I mean, so he was enough to get in. They let him in circulation police. They just didn't make him top dog because he's an immigrant. <laughs> or maybe not, but you know, he never said anything like that, but my mom always said that that's why. Yeah, you don't want, I mean, because if he had been blocked off if he had been blocked off everything, well, he was a World War II veteran. He had a lot of buddies who were World War II veterans from that area. And they actually took on the Detroit mob when it came to politics. They had this group called the Detroit Purple Gang. You've probably never heard of them because nobody ever questioned them. You didn't want to say anything to cross them. Yeah, people make it seem like Detroit somehow became corrupt in 2008. <laughs> no, we're talking back, back in Depression times, 40s and 50s. And so this group of World War II veterans, they were the only ones who weren't scared by the mob because, let's face it, they didn't seem worse. Didn't win all their battles. He actually ran for public office. He's where I become a political science major, by the way. Growing up, listening to all of his war stories, his politics stories, his banking stories. Got me to uh, watch the fourth and deciding game, fifth deciding game of the World Series in 1984. Good to have connections. Got to see big old riot, biggest riot after a World Series ever. Yeah. That was fun. You take me for intro to political science, I get more into endonic riots and stuff, and how that's a perfect example. But yeah, you don't want to lock out all the immigrants, all the non wasps, all the Catholics, all the. Oh, and he was Catholic. So that was another strike against him immigrant and Catholic. But they realized in the 40s and 50s, these were some talented individuals. They started running for office. They started organizing. 
So they started letting him into a couple clubs. Like you ever heard of the Kiwanis Club? Yeah, they loosened up their membership a little bit, so they let him in. It's a civic, it's a civic organization. I've spoken to them a couple times. They're trying to get me to join, but they have membership dues, and you have to, you know, you do a series of us um, service activities and social activities too. And their barbecue idea sounds like it's almost got me. <laughs> the masses. Mostly passive, somewhat ignorant, easily manipulated. But these wannabe or possible elites who aren't wasps, they could organize the masses and overthrow the system. We call that the French Revolution, the English Revolution, the American Revolution. That's the problem with the British. They treated the colonists like second class citizens. They had a pecking order going. That didn't work for uh, some talented elites in the U.S. Thus, we had a revolution. Know that Aristotle, the father of democracy, did not like democracy. What was democracy for him? Yeah, chaos. People don't know any better. I remember a politician saying, saying like, I'd rather be led by the first first hundred people in the phone book then led by who's in Washington, D.C. This is not an elite opinion. If you know anybody with the last name Aaron, who's scary. <laughs> Although Hank Aaron would be kind of cool. Yeah, he said we needed an elite republic, representative government. Know what Hobbes said. We allow government because we're scared of the movie The Purge. <laughs> right? That's how people, seriously, that's how people feel. The elites will say, if we aren't ruling things, it's going to be like The Purge. We need order in the system. We need, we need a system of political control. Back the blue. And I, I'm not an authoritarian. Well, you're supporting authority. I know authoritarian makes you sound like a Nazi or something. Don't worry, they're totalitarians. I'm <laughs> making part of that. Yes, I'm trying to. <coughs> you know, if you let people, if you let the majority rule on everything, well, let's do a little example. In just a little bit. We'll talk about who's a minority in this class. But know also for the exam what a republic is, and what a democracy is, and where we have them, and where we don't have them. We have both. Some people say, we're a democratic republic. That's not exactly true. Nationally, we're a republic. Locally, and at your state level, we are more democratic. Other countries, believe it or not, they actually allow you to vote on national issues. But we beat them in other ways. Don't worry. We'll, we'll cover that a little later this time. We may be a little more, the lowercase d, democratic more than you think. So they got us beat on other countries, like a lot of European countries. They have, they actually, uh, well, they don't directly elect their chief executives. That's another story. But they do allow citizens to vote on issues at the national level. Can you think of a really famous example where all the people of a country voted on an issue this summer? Yes! Britain! Excellent! Do you remember what it was called? Anybody? Brexit. What the hell was Brexit? Yeah. The people in Britain voted on whether they want to leave the European Union. By the way, all the elites Liberal or conservative, we're all for staying in the uh, European Union, but the masses rose up and they voted. See, the elites miscalculated. They read the polls saying that most people would want to stay in the European Union. So they said, eh, we'll let a little democracy go in. Do you know? I mean, it's like everything's going chaotic. They didn't do their polls very well. They didn't check out with people. They uh, oversampled certain things. They made a huge miscalculation. 
for the elites. The European Union is something that benefits the elites, and now they're in a lot of trouble because, I mean, they're out. Other countries are mad. They're kicking Britain out. Britain ha doesn't have a lot of trade deals with others. Britain is based on trade deals. So they're desperately trying to sign something with the United States, and Barack Obama's going, <laughs> you guys are a bit of a pickle. Okay, yeah, we'll do a trade deal, of course, with you. Conspiracy theorists about his Kenyan ancestors being colonized by British. A little overstated. Don't worry, Britain, although they're afraid of that. Now, we'll do a deal with you. But it doesn't matter if Trump or Romney or McCain or Obama or Clinton is in there. They're all going to do what's best for the U.S. We've got the power, and Britain needs us more than we need them. So we'll make a deal that's going to benefit U.S. first, no matter who's president. Trump, yes. Obama, too. I don't know, maybe he might be nicer to the British. Yeah, the European countries that Britain has had a long trading relationship. Hey, you guys dumped on us with the Brexit vote. We'll trade with you, but on our terms. Yeah, Britain's elites are going to be in a world of hurt. Who else are you going to go to? China? Actually, that's what they're doing now. They are that desperate. I hope the Chinese aren't mad about that opium war, <laughs> one or two, back in the 1830s. You remember those? How good is the British now? Like, is it pretty well off? It, 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 it tanked the same way ours tanked during the Great Recession. They, had, they took it on the chin. They had largely made back a lot of those gains. They were doing pretty well. Nobody's thinking Britain's going to look better. It would take a miracle for Britain to keep it going. But most people didn't realize that when they voted. They didn't vote on that issue. They listened to people of the UK Independence Party who said, all that money we spend on the European Union is going to go back in your pockets. They lied! It isn't going back to the British people. At most, you might get like 100 pounds for every British person. How much you're going to lose in terms of trade deals and the wealth of companies, you're going to be losing a couple thousand pounds for every hundred you get back. Bad move. And people are even saying now, this is what you get with democracy. People will make stupid decisions. If you let people vote, they let the Palestinian people vote. So the Palestinians voted for the terrorists, Hamas, because they had a better PR campaign. And people said, stupid George W. Bush, you pushed for democracy for Palestine, and now the terrorists are in charge. Thanks a lot. I'm not criticizing George W. Bush. I thought you know, having democracy was a good thing. But people use that who are elitists who are saying, see, you voted in the terrorists. Bad move. Bush is, he didn't help anybody get in office. We just kind no, of no. Oh, I'm not criticizing him at all. Actually, I think that in, in a lot of ways, I mean, short term it looks bad. Long term it's good for the area because sooner or later those terrorists who think they have all the answer, people will get to realize they're a bunch of charlatans. And long term people will start supporting more moderate leaders in Palestine. Might take a little longer than we thought because those Hamas folks have guns. Yeah, that's what we that's what we looked at last year. And when my classes were Bush went over there. Yeah. And then but he didn't he didn't help set up anything. He didn't help set up a government. Yeah, he was a champion of democracy, yeah. you know, Operation Iraqi Freedom and so Yeah, that was another problem. Everyone kept saying, Oh, you should put a general in charge of the country. Nah, he voted for things and a bunch of people who don't like us got into office. That's why we're not in Iraq anymore. People believe that if you let the people vote, this sort of thing happens. This is not Dr. Curtis's opinion. I'm giving you a lead. Does that make sense? So, remember, I'm not here to cheerlead or you know, say this is the right theory or not. It's an ongoing debate. It won't be settled. They're vague, abstract theories applied to a lot of situations. But maybe you've heard some of these arguments before. Right? Make sense? Like, if, you, if we'd say, ah, we let all LC students vote, uh, then you all vote for de demolishing Pitstorm and turning it into a parking lot. All the people in Pitstorm are like, what? That sucks for us. Well, you're in the minority. All the other dorms voted to get rid of you guys and uh, make parking spaces. That's an elitist argument. Maybe they hadn't thought of that one yet. Heck, I thought of it two seconds ago. On the pluralist theory. This is opposite. 
So right now, y'all are like, wait a minute, you're going to total 180. Yes, this is a different theory. This is a theory that is competing with the Leda's theory. They have a different view. Tyreek, what does plural mean? Two, two just two? Many. Two or more. Plural. Many. Usually when you say plural, you're thinking a bunch more than just two, but I, technically you would be right. Yeah, so that's how you remember pluralism. Plural meaning many. That's the most important word in pluralism. Plural or many. Make sense? We are made, society is made up of groups. It's just natural for people to kind of congregate together. We could have done it a bunch of ways. One that people most cite, it's not the only one, and you'll learn this. How do people distinguish different humans? What's the variable we use? Yeah, what color? Yeah, black or white, what? Eye color? Skin color, yeah. That's how we decide races, right? Different skin color. We could have made a hair. So Brittany and I are of different races. Because you have red hair and I've got no hair, okay? I'm part of the bald here. Yeah. We can even discriminate bald versus non-bald or something, right? You can do it by black hair, brown hair, blonde hair. We could have done it that way, couldn't we? Seriously. We just decide on skin color. We could be like that, uh, you remember that Dr. Seuss, the star belly sneeches, where they have like the star on their stomach or something, and people kept trying to change it around. You remember that? Yeah, however we do things. It's not the only way we decide on groups. How else do we decide on groups? Gender. Gender. Okay, yeah, we decided. And it's getting kind of blurry, but you know, in like North Carolina or something like that. But uh, I mean, you know, th there are people who try to say, no, we, need, we have like multiple genders or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, and there, there are people. I'm not, I'm not advocating this as not one way or the other. People are saying that gender is an artificial construct. I've heard that term. That term is clear. And whether you agree or disagree with it, there are certainly a fair number of Americans who are like, let people do their own thing. It's kind of an American thing. Right? What are other ways in which we distinguish ourselves? But we'll say the majority at least, even if they don't like the concept of transgenderism, they don't want to like lock them out of the bathroom. Because we've all gone to that gas station where the bathroom is locked and you're like, eee. Go ahead. Religion. Ooh, our belief system about the almighty or the afterlife. The heavens and the hell and stuff. Okay, so that's one way we distinguish ourselves. How else? What other groups do we do? Oh, like who were interested? Okay, that makes sense. I was trying to think what movie it was Adam Sandler, Kevin James, or something like that. And they were like, they were, they they wanted to be like cross dressers so they could get into something. And so they're the guys buying feminine products or something like that. And they're like, <laughs> no, you're doing it wrong. But yeah, okay. Which other people? Which other people we prefer to be with? Our company. All right. Who else? What else, what other ways do we uh, create different groups? Financial. Financial, okay. We even call it, we have a names for this. What, what names do we use to determine financial differences? Class. Class, yes. Which classes? My class. No. Which classes? Which classes? Yeah. Oh, well, there's uh, upper class, upper middle, middle, yeah. lower middle, lower. Ooh, rare do you get one who does five, but yes. <laughs> uh, to simplify, upper middle, lower, two in between. Because most of us wealthy political science classes and those poor business people. All Forbes. Just kidding. Off, off, Sorry, Lydia. Off of Forbes, a millionaire is just a, uh, is still middle class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we argue about where the lines are. But yeah, we a lot of times we'll distinguish ourselves by economic class. We also do it by social class. You know what social class is? That's kind of close. Yeah, like how people perceive your job. Most of my American experience classes, this is like, boom. They have no idea what the hell social class is. And they keep using social class when they really mean economic class. I'll, I'll simplify it for you really quick. With two jobs, we begin with the letter P. One of them involving it somewhat. 
my, uh, my wife's uncle is a plumber. He makes a lot more money than I do. And it's not fair, but a lot of people look down on plumbers. It's a dirty job. Makes a lot of money. If you don't believe me, you could be like my brother-in-law who decided to fix our toilet, which had the world's tiniest drip. He decided to do this on Christmas Eve around 7 p.m. No, 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 I got it. And it turned into like Old Faithful in our bathroom and like Geyser was going. You know, <laughs> well, one of us was frantically holding it. My wife was calling the plumber. It is not cheap to do this sort of thing. Let's just say, uh, you know, guests coming on in had to ship to a cheaper hotel. And <laughs> some people had to pull out sleeping bags. <laughs> yeah, plumbers make a hell of a lot of money. But people don't give the same prestige to being a plumber. My wife's uncle is trying to get his son and daughter to take over the family business. He's got, I mean, he's got two houses in Orlando. Orlando, oh, not bad houses, good houses. It's not even called Orlando, it's like a fancy name. Can't get anyone to do the business. Son doesn't want to do it. Why? It's a plumber. Good money. Hard work. Crappy job sometimes. High economic class, lower social class. Me. Okay, I'm driving the same car <laughs> from the year before I came here. And it's a 2000 Saturn, okay? It's not that, I'm, I'm driving it until it dies and then I'll get a new one, probably used. It's not, it doesn't make that much money. I, I turned, I made a lot more defense contract work. I, I, think, I, uh, I think I'm making 25,000 less than I did. But I jumped for this chance. Your money goes further down here than it does in DC, and I love this job. It's not a high paying job. Just letting you know. Very high social class, however. I have a lot of people trying to get me to go speak to their groups and they hang on every word and stuff like that. You know, it's kind of neat. I hope they pay for my deal. <laughs> okay, so I'm not like poor, poor. You know. I'm, uh, you know, I'm middle class. My uncle is easily upper middle class. If he really told us how much he made, we'd probably be uh, upper class. Just scrape an upper class. What financial status makes you upper class? Like, how much money would you would you make for you to be considered upper class? Well, he just class. said Forbes said millionaire. <laughs> well, the last the There's last Forbes bank. article I actually read it was it's kind of a, a a little blurry line, but anything over uh, eighteen million in assets makes you upper class. But it's the, the lower range of upper class. And that's that's $18 million worth of liquidatable asset. And how do you find out if you're lower class? Does anybody know? The government actually calculates this for you. Poverty line. Yep. How much money for a family of four estimated? But I don't have a family of four. Well, you know, you break it down for one person. So that's how you know if you're lower class or not. Upper class, I guess middle is everything in between. Like, if I made this money in D.C., I would be lower middle class. Down here, I'm about middle. Maybe a tiny bit higher. Especially if I get that raise. Do me good evals. <laughs> Just kidding, President McAllister. But we get power through these groups. We're also part of professional groups. Anyone here in the NRA? No? I usually have one. Okay, good. Yeah, that gives you power, right? I bet you your gun is a lot more secure now that you're a member of the NRA. Even if Grant owns a gun and isn't in the NRA, John's group keeps you secure. We'll talk about that group later. Not the NRA, but... <laughs> I'm not saying you have a gun, but if you were and uh, John did all the work to protect your gun rights, there's a term for that. We'll cover it during interest groups. But yeah, racial groups, ethnic groups, what country you came from, your gender, what part of the country you live in? Southerners, Northerners, New Englanders, Californians, <laughs> whatever the hell Alaska would be. Westerners, I guess. What profession? When you all jump into a profession, that would be your group, your team, your gang, whatever. How much studying you did? College students, you joined a group. You didn't think you did. No, I, I just went off to college. You're a group. You're identified as college student, right? You'll jump on to another group in a couple of years, right? Your hobbies, interested in guns. Your age is a group. 
You know what I tell people? When I turn 50, the day I turn 50, I am signing up for AARP. I know people who are in their 70s and 80s who won't sign up because it'll make me feel old. No, AARP is the most powerful group out there. The discounts I would get alone. Jack and probably stay for free. They're so powerful. I could knuckle under a little motel in Hogan'sville. No, I have signed it up for that power. Would you be old? You're not retired. I care about power. I tested it to slither in the sun. <laughs> Forget. <laughs> we have power for the person. I, as one person, as one professor, am not as powerful. But as part of the AARP, I'm going to be powerful. More powerful. I'm going to get a magazine that's going to tell me how to live longer. It's going to tell me how to uh, live on something other than Social Security and dog food. It's going to tell me uh, how to get the best possible health care. They'll work as a team. They'll negotiate the lower rates. They'll make Blue Cross blink. Seriously. They'll help get involved in laws. I can't wait till I turn 50. I want to be old. And then when you go to the movies, you get senior citizen discounts. And then they, you know, so I can see like all the Captain America movies, not just a couple of them. I can see them twice. Why the hell do you think they have senior citizen discounts? Well, some of it is they want more old people going to the theater, but well, old people go to the theater. Power, folks. I'm going to tell you something you may not realize. Everyone in this room is a minority. This is why our Constitution has minority rights. We have only been wired to think of one minority group, African Americans. Or if you grew up in El Paso, Texas like me, Hispanics, which I always found odd because I went to a school that was 90% Hispanic, and I'm like, they're like, Hispanics are a minority. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, I, I was stunned. Seriously, when I went off to college, I went to a school that was it was 90, I went from a school that was 90% Hispanic to a school that was 90% white, and I was like, well, it was the most number of white people I've ever seen ever in my life. <laughs> and they all kind of spoke a slightly different language, and they had different customs, and it was like, okay, got to figure out how to fit in with all the white people. <laughs> it's funny because I'm actually white. You can do a TV show about this. It wouldn't last long, but you can do a TV show about it. <laughs> No, seriously, I told you that story about like when everyone was like, what, the first time a group was, hey, let's all go out, you know, uh, where should we, what kind of restaurant? Let's go out for Mexican. I said, Mexican what? And they all laughed. I didn't know what they meant. They're like, what do you call it? Where do you go? Well, we go out, let's go out to eat. <laughs> you just went out to eat. You didn't call it Mexican. I didn't know it was actually called Mexican food until I went until I got around a bunch of white people. I said, well, you all don't say, let's go out for American. Let's go out for white food. Nobody says that. You can do, go to White Castle, but not white food. Camera still on. Yes. No, seriously. It was weird, because I, I didn't realize, I was like part of a majority. I didn't even know that. Like in Spanish class, oh, if you really want to feel like a minority. I mean, everyone grew up speaking this from birth, and here I'm in Spanish class going like, yeah, every so often I'd say a word, and everybody in the class would laugh, and they're like, oh, don't worry, he's the white kid. <laughs> Seriously. He didn't know that that word also meant air conditioner. To this day, I still haven't figured out how I messed that one up. Like, nobody wanted to pick me. They picked me for basketball, because I was fairly tall, but nobody picked me for, uh, like in Spanish class, I was like the kid nobody wanted on their dialogue. The bad kids got me. Because I knew Spanish the least. I solved this by dating a gal whose folks only spoke Spanish. And if you think going through high school is awkward, try doing it in another language. Like trying to ask somebody, you know, I want to take your daughter out, and you're like sweating out, like, God, I hope I say the right thing. I want to, and it comes up on Facebook. Yeah, that's a worst thing to say. <laughs> I mean, she could speak English fine, but I mean, she was born in Mexico. But yeah, her folks didn't speak a word of English. And it's, it, they were kind of old school, so it's not like she could translate for me. I had to like do the asking myself. <coughs> so her brother, <laughs> your brother in uh, my high school, he became a really good friend. Please God, don't mess me up when I say this right. But we're all minorities, believe it or not. 
every one of you is a minority. Right? We have racial minorities. It's estimated sometime between 2040 and 2050, whites will be a minority. Whites will still be the largest ethnic group or racial group. They'll still be the largest group. They just, non whites will outnumber them. And I know some people, maybe on this campus, maybe in this community, maybe a couple hundred miles from here are saying, not if Trump gets elected. No, even if Trump gets elected. It's not about the wall, it's about birth rates. Birth rates are much higher among non-whites than whites. In fact, whites are actually, we would be shrinking as a country if it weren't for non-whites. White birth rates are a fraction. And they're going lower every year. I mean, unless, unless like a government went to white people and said, you better have like four kids. The Germans did this, Nazi Germany. <laughs> Iran did this for a while. This was stupid of Iran. They suddenly became overpopulated. So there are reverse consequences with this sort of thing. But yeah, whites will be a minority. Largest group, but they'll still be outvoted. Got a couple males in this class. You make up less than 50% of this country. Women outnumber men. Are you a gun owner? I had people tell me that like, like there's like four guns for every American. Want to know what the gun owners like households with a gun? Yes, 40%, 45. 45 pistol. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. Just a joke. Anywhere between 23 and 27 percent of households have a firearm. That's really a lot. Yeah, it is. I have people. You lie! I, I don't. It, it honestly doesn't. I mean, whether it's 30, whether it's 40, whether it's 60, it really doesn't matter to me. It's also like people who live around here with that maybe. Yeah, out here it's probably higher. Yeah, I was thinking of the line in Miss Congeniality, you ever seen that movie? Like, this is Texas, everyone has a gun, my florist has a gun. <laughs> and one guy goes, I don't have a gun, my parents were Quakers. <laughs> Nobody else says anything. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do. It's like, well, everyone I know has a gun. Doesn't mean everyone in America has a gun. And actually what you find is, well, what about all these firearms? Nobody owns a gun. They own a lot of guns. You see that one guy who died who had like 40,000 guns? I mean, yeah. I think he died of a heart attack. Or they're still trying to figure out like why he died, but they just like, I mean, he had storage lockers all over the place, his whole house. Like, I mean, it was like a hoarder's yeah. mill of guns. The police you know what a gun rack is? I mean, it's not for one gun. <laughs> it's for many guns. But, I'm sorry, I interrupt. Yeah, they, they take all his guns they didn't even have reason to do it. Like, oh, you got like 200,000 people. Yeah, guns all over the place. So people are like, you're anti-gun. No, I'm just trying to figure out how many Americans own a gun. And it's a minority. In fact, if I were a gun owner, I'd want to know that. Not only that, that's why the NRA is so important and why the NRA is fighting so hard against any gun regulation. Because they're a minority. They are. The majority of Americans do not own a gun. And it's a smaller percentage, so that's why the NRA has to fight so bitterly. I'm not saying the NRA is right or wrong, I'm just saying this is the work that you've got cut out for you. It's like the next coach of the LA Rams, this is your team. <laughs> Deal with it. Get, you know, trade around, get some players, motivate them, get a better coach, whatever. But don't, don't think you're a Super Bowl contender. Now, you've got to work at it. That's what the NRA has to deal with. You're a college student, right? Congratulations, you're a minority. Every one of you is. The percentage of Americans with a college degree is similar to those with a uh, gun, households with a gun. Somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. Now, some have like degrees from like those online colleges or something like that. They're kind of fake institutions. So that it might be up to 35 percent, but somebody who's going to like take an actual college degree. I just saw another online college just morphed up. 
I know because every time I look up LaGrange, they always take like a different online college that tries to take our spot. They pay for Google to LaGrange College. Here's an online college you never heard of. You have to scroll down a little bit to get, I don't know, what you asked for. Hi, two tickets to see uh, Sully. Well, uh, there's also the Storks movie. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, two tickets to see Sully. Well, don't you want to see... No. That's Google for you. Take it up with my brother. He works for Google. Right? But all of you... So that's why you need groups. College students need to band together. National Organization for Women. Women got together to band together because for a long time they were a minority, and certainly a minority in politics. You heard a group called Emily's List, it's a liberal group. Uh, Phyllis Shapley, who died recently, a conservative, she had like an Eagle Forum, which was designed to help conservative women. You, these are minority groups. You get to realize that just darn near about everybody is a minority. I've learned that there's this term called white splaining, where white people try and say how they're oppressed or something. I'm not saying that, but numbers will tell you everybody's a minority. And that's why everybody needs minority rights. Minority rights are everybody's rights. If you don't believe me, run the numbers yourself. Everybody's a minority. I guess human beings, that's where we're a majority, but it's kind of 100%. That's the most artificial people come along and overtake us like the Bruce Willis movie surrogates. Y'all are looking at me funny. It's just a movie, folks. Just sci fi. But do you understand now? Minority. You all are. That's why pluralism, you need to band together. You need a team to unite. It's what gives you strength. One stick, bam, easily broken. Bunch of sticks, a little harder. Harder to break you when you're together as a team. Whereas anybody see Harry Potter movies? Harry Potter's getting on people's cases. I think it was like Harry Potter 4 or 5. They all kind of blend together because my kids love them. We watch the movies a lot. It's like the, the, the Harry Potter feels all alone and uh, he's talking to the crazy gal who's got blonde hair and she says, well, if you're just alone, then you're not as much trouble for all the bad guys. You know, shouldn't be isolating yourselves. You should be part of a team. So he goes back to his friends, apologizes for being a jerk, and they go on and they defeat him. Democracy for pluralism is a good thing, not a bad thing. It is not something to be shunned or feared, but something to be embraced. John, your comments about, well, George W. Bush had a lot, you know, his heart was in the right place, and he had some good ideas for the Middle East. Yeah, pluralists would like that. I was saying that he left the Middle East in a local power. Well, that's what democracy does. You can't pick the outcomes, then it wouldn't be democracy. It'd be authoritarian. Do you all know that Russia's holding elections this weekend? Why bother? Putin's forces have already won. Literally. I think they stuffed all the ballots. It's like a shirt. Or charade for you Americans. But yes, popular, that means people's participation in government. It's a key thing. Majority rule, yes. But you have, it's majority rule, you can't just have majority rule. You have to have minority rights. Everyone's rights need to be protected. Pluralists, many. There are a lot of you, but many, but not a majority. Right? All of us are minorities, just trying to keep uh, the majority from overruling us. John, you remember the NRA? You're outnumbered by 75% of the population. Maybe 73%. Right? Who else? Anybody part of a group? Sierra Club? Anybody part of a group? A team? A sports team? You know, the number of athletes is a smaller group. Non-athletes are always looking to regulate athletics and sports. Are they not? Set of rules. Some of them are good rules. Some of them are a little ticky-tack. Concussion protocol is a good idea. Uh, severe limits on practice and what you get to eat and uh, okay, you get to see it's a slippery slope. You know, football was almost banned in this country by Teddy Roosevelt, right? I got to 
I got to meet Bobby about it on Tuesday night. He talked about how before he took over, Florida State was actually uh, getting ready to shut down their football program. People just couldn't see the interest in it. School was struggling financially. Yeah, the, the ones who wanted to keep football hired Bobby, or begged Bobby about it to come on down. They were just hoping against hope that he could somehow turn things around. Florida State's made enough money that they can be able, you know, they, they were able to meet ACC uh, high academic standards, and they have things like the National Magnet High Lab that I work for. One of three in the country is partnering with Los Alamos. Lots of good. I mean, you know, now it's an academic powerhouse, not just an athletic powerhouse. Commitment to John Locke's values, life, liberty, and property. That's what government should do, or in our case, pursuit of happiness. Government's not a method of control, it's a method of protection of our rights. Yes, Caitlin, the Constitution has a lot of you must do this, or these groups have these powers, but it's got those amendments in there where government's supposed to protect the rights of everybody. So pluralist is more optimistic. Elitists are more pessimistic. Equality of opportunity, as opposed to what? Equality of results. Betsy, how are those different? What does equality of opportunity mean to you? Everybody has an equal chance. Perfect. Put that down in your definition. Everybody's got an equal chance. What does equality of results mean? How is that different? Well, let's take that one on. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do, the results are the same. Anybody watch the Olympics? You ever watch it and you see some people are starting closer up, some people are going further back, and you're like, that doesn't look fair. Why do they do that? Yeah. Like if you have the inside track, it's literally good, right? You got to stay in your lanes when you run the 400, right? That's the ones around the track. Why don't you have them all lined up the same line? Yeah, further out is going to get screwed over, right? You have to run more. <laughs> and when we're talking about nanoseconds separating these folks, uh, that's pretty tough, right? So that's why they have to stagger it so everyone is running the same distance, 400 meters, right? That's equality of opportunity. What's equality of results? Everybody, has, well, everyone wins, or everybody has to finish at the exact same time. So the faster ones, uh, they get tripped up like it's one of those Braves mascot things. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, or they shoot somebody who's going too fast or something. Now we're at equality of opportunity. Now how do we know any of these are right? In the last time, elitists say government ignores public opinion when it comes to laws. Pluralists are like, no, 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 no. The, uh, the government listens to the people. They try and it, they try and implement the will of the major, the will of the majority, but with minority protections. So we do a hypothesis test. What if we looked at how people feel about an issue, and whether that becomes law or not? So personal preferences leading to laws. Or support for a policy, right? In theory, should mean look, it's more likely to become a law, right? Does this all make sense? Yes. So you understand how this how this is a hypothesis test? It's a vague theory, elitism and pluralism. One specific test. Are you ready? Ta da! If it has an asterisk next to it, that means that it has not become law. No asterisk, it became law. This says, well, can you read it, folks in the front? Okay. What it says is 83% of people want a balanced budget amendment. And of course, we have those, right? Hmm. Hmm. Why are you laughing? Our budget has been balanced in 30 years. Well, actually, since the 2000s. <laughs> like the later part of the Clinton years, 90s, with Gingrich and uh, the Republicans in Congress, dividing government. Yeah, we balanced the budget. Last time we did so was like 16, 17 years ago. Raising the minimum wage, it's become law. English is the official language. Not law. No. Even though 
82% of people want it. Life sentences for drug dealers, it became law. Death penalty, 79% support it, it became law. Term limits for Congress, and of course we have those. Shaking your head. Reducing all government agencies, that's like having fewer government agencies. Two year cutoff for welfare without work. Actually, that's a law. 71% of people agree. Mandatory job retraining. It's a law. 69% of people want doctor assisted suicide to be available. Is that legal? Has to be jailed Dr. Kevorkian whether that's law or not. Right, he died. School choice. 68% of people support it. But it's not law. Got to go to the public school you're assigned to. Do you see how this works? For the exam, this is what I call the spoiler alert. So make sure you jot it down, type it up, do something. I like hypothesis tests. I populate my essays with hypothesis tests. Sydney is nodding her head because she's had this class before. Brian is probably smirking, but he knows. Perhaps John as well. I like hypothesis tests for essays. If I go over a hypothesis test, it's going to be highly likely to be on the exam. I would love to put this up on the exam, this graphic, and say, what do you notice? Because there's two things. First, you might want to count. How many of these are the popular will? Oh, and by the way, we're uh, down here, where a minority of people want it, only a minority of people want it, and it becomes law. That's also an issue. Do you understand how that works? Like only seven, like 17% of people want the U.S. to be withdrawn from the U.N. We don't do it. 77% disagree. We're still in the U.N. Make sense? So this is strength for the theory. You might count asterisks. That's one way to do it. Secondly, you might look. English is the official language. A majority want it. Is pluralism wrong? Got to remember what pluralism is. Majority rule only? No, it's protection for minorities. minorities. Those who do not have English as a first language. Does that make sense? I'm not saying you have to agree or disagree with the law. I'm just trying to say, a pluralist would say, no, 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 that doesn't ruin our theory. Because this is a case of minority rights prevailing. All you have to do is you have to know the theory know how to test it. Whether you're liberal, moderate, conservative, libertarian, authoritarian, statist, whatever, Green Party, your views are your own and you should keep them. Don't be influenced by me. So you should know how to test something to see whether there's some evidence for it. So I'd love to see in your essay on the exam what it is. Whoops, see it. Sydney, how far are you? Do you have a class of 1240? Well, I do, so I'll be brief. Okay. Better run. All right. You know how you hate when I put you on the 